We have two goals this week. We'll learn about another kind of machine learning, reinforcement learning. In this type of machine learning, there are no labels and there are no huge collections of data that are fed into the system. This is a way for machines to learn from experience. We'll also learn about AI and robots. Robots and robotic systems can be trained using reinforcement learning, both in simulations and in real-world environments. Now, you might have imagined that robots are programmed with some kind of fixed rules, but remember the long tail. There are too many unforeseen or unknowable situations in the real world for programmers to be able to write rules to fit every situation. So what you want to do is develop a robot or a, with a, a system that has some kind of flexibility to it. With reinforcement learning, the idea is to let the system fail and fail and fail until it gets it right. And then the system gets a reward. Now, it takes a lot of episodes before a reinforcement train system is any good. So this means the failing a lot, the getting the reward after many, many, many attempts that didn't do anything, and then running it again and running it again. An episode is one complete session that ends with the system learning something. And that means it received a reward. We had previously talked about good old-fashioned AI, or GoFi, which used strictly programmed rules. Reinforcement learning is not like that. So this week, we will only talk about reinforcement learning, which includes a technique called Q-learning. You'll remember from a previous week that there are three broad types of machine learning. So far in the course, we have concentrated on supervised learning. That's the kind with the labeled data, and you need really, really a lot of data. We will continue talking about reinforcement learning next week when we discuss AI systems that play games. Regardless of whether the system is controlling a robot or if it's a system that plays a game like chess, a system that learns with reinforcement will include these four aspects. The agent is the system itself. It's important to bear in mind that the agent is just software. It's the program that learns. The actions are programmed into the system. So the robot dog system that's described by Mitchell can only do three things. It can take a step forward, it can take a step backward, and it can kick. That system doesn't have an option to jump. It doesn't have an option to step to the side. Its programming defines its actions, and each system would have its own possible actions. The environment is not infinite. It's not the whole world. So if the system is operating in a maze, then the maze would be the environment. If the system is using machine vision, what is in its field of vision would be its environment. The state is where everything is right now. It's what exists in this moment and what the system knows about what exists in this moment. So it can't go beyond the environment, say. As soon as the agent takes one action, then that is a new state. A second action, now things have changed again, so that is another new state. Finally, the reward is like points in a game. If you're playing a video game for the first time, you might just die 10 times before you ever get any points at all, right? You might have to end the game, end the game, end the game, and then finally you learn how to get some points. Each time you play a video game, you're learning more about the game and probably your score is going to be better each time. This is the same idea. This reward is like you getting points in a game. So the program is not blank or empty when the learning cycle starts. 
the actions are programmed in. The reward, or maybe multiple rewards, they are already programmed in. The system is already programmed to store information about each state and when it happens that a reward is given or they get a reward, right? So as an example, at zero steps away, the action was kick and the reward was obtained. So that's some information that the system would, would store, put into memory. And this is like the system remembering what worked. But just because the system got it right one time, it kicked the ball when it was zero steps away, it doesn't necessarily know that kicking is only good at zero steps away. So then it might go into like a stuck pattern where it just kicks and kicks and kicks and doesn't move. And then you'd have to restart it and have a new episode of the reinforcement learning. So just like uh, image recognition needs many, many, many epochs of training and many millions of images, for reinforcement learning, you have to have the, the agent uh, try to get the reward many, many, many times, like hundreds of times. And within each time, that is an episode, the, the system, the agent, might just like keep doing the actions at the wrong time or the wrong place and fail and fail many, many times. So it's only after these hundreds or possibly thousands of different episodes of reinforcement learning that the system has actually learned what you set out to have it learn. So just imagine how much more it would take compared with Mitchell's example of the robot and the ball. If you were trying to get a system to learn how to play a complicated game like chess, or you, know, you were trying to train uh, manufacturing robots how to do the right thing when uh, the car on the assembly line was in the right position. So since this would take even longer, if you had to use the real physical robot, if you're training a robot, um, it, you know, because then it's like the robot can only move so fast. And if it, say, it drops something, maybe a human has to run in and pick it up and then put it back in the place where the robot can see it. Um, a lot of this training is done in simulations. So what you'll have is a 3D simulation and the agent, recall, is a computer program that's learning. So after it's learned, later you can put this program into a real robot or connect it to the real robot, and the robot can do what was learned in the simulation. Simulations can be conducted at lightning speed. So millions of episodes could take place in days instead of years. And also, each episode itself can run much, much faster because it's, it's like you're doing it at 10 times speed or triple speed because the simulation doesn't have physical objects. Now, to give you a better idea of how reinforcement learning actually works, we're going to have to talk a little bit about cue learning. You'll see how the computer program keeps track of the current state and the possible actions available to it. Cue learning does not require a neural network, although sometimes a system will have a combination of neural networks, possibly more than one, along with cue learning. Like these things can be connected together to make one big complex system. So with Mitchell's example of the robot dog that kicks a ball, that learns to kick a ball, right? Mitchell shows us a table like this in the book. The table for cue learning is called a cue table. Imagine that. And the system uses this table to keep track of what it has learned. Now, this is kind of like the weights in a neural network that's trained to recognize images. The values of the actions in the cue table begin at zero. So these values reflect what the system is learning, and so they change with each episode of learning. Uh, and notice that every possible state is represented in the table, and all possible actions for a state 
are given a value. So uh, you have a state and the possible actions for that state and a value for each possible action. So at first, everything is zero. These values change as the system learns which actions are best in a particular state. That is how the learning happens. Now, the changes occur based on equations and formulas that we will not be looking at. So in this simple example, there's only one reward, and that is for kicking the ball at the right time. So the reward will only be given when there are zero steps between the robot and the ball. As the system learns the value in that position, in that particular state plus actions, that value for kick will increase. And as training goes on for episode after episode, gradually predictions are made, predictions again, based on formulas and equations, right? As to what actions in what state will be likely to get me to the award if I'm the agent, right? So that's why here you see forward starts to have more value the closer the agent is, the closer that the you know moving robot is to the ball. And uh, in some cases, it might look like backward has some value, but the closer that the robot would get to the ball, backward would have no value at all because it would learn that going backward doesn't help it get to the goal. So let's get into a little bit of nitty gritty briefly here. Let's say the environment for the robot is 10 by 10, a grid of squares. This way it's easy for us to picture the robot's steps, one step per square. Now, a computer would represent this grid with 100 pairs of coordinates. The first number in a pair represents the row, so 0 to 9 is 10 rows, and the second number in each pair represents the column, so 0 to 9 is 10 columns. Now, keep in mind, if the robot had a machine vision system, this wouldn't apply then the robot's perception of the environment would come from the cameras. This is something you saw in the spot video where the robot dog from uh, Boston Dynamics has multiple cameras as part of its robot. Now, the state is the current position of the robot and the current position of the ball. And given these two values or these two pairs of coordinates, we can calculate the, the actual state, which in this example is the number of steps away from the ball, okay? So the robot's allowed actions are to go closer to the ball, which is called forward, or farther away from the ball, which is called backward. And it can also kick but when it kicks, it doesn't move, right? And in the state shown here, kicking is useless. The actions are what the robot is able to do in the current state. So in a more complicated example, it might be able to do certain things in a particular state, but not be able to do those things in a different state. You might think of a chess piece, right? Sometimes the chess piece is permitted to move and sometimes it's not permitted to move depending on the state of the board. So in the state shown here, the robot can kick or it can move to one of the marked squares. And our example is so simple, we're not gonna allow it to make diagonal moves. So. Uh, the two green squares shown here are closer to the ball, so they would be forward. And the two blue squares are farther from the ball, so they would be backward. So the robot can choose any path to the ball. Any of these steps, if it kept moving toward the ball, would be forward. Um, but in this simple example, when it's at this distance, the shortest path is always gonna be seven steps. So um, if it went one move closer, then it would be six steps. If it went one move farther away, it would be eight steps. Now, I'm showing this to you so that you can have a more realistic idea of how things are represented in the program. So diagrams and so forth are not in the program. Those, like the grid is represented by numbers. 
the Q table that's shown in your book is accurate, but the program does not actually see a table. So in addition to the pairs that represent the grid or the environment, in the program, there will be another set of numbers, an array or a list of numbers that would represent what we saw in the Q table earlier. Instead of the table that we see, the program would have this, this collection of code, right? Now, obviously, there would be more code, especially the calculations for the probabilities as the robot took actions again and again and again. Every action and every state is recorded. Every time the reward is given is also recorded. So the position coordinates on the field of play in this example are only important for calculating the distance between the robot and the ball. And the coordinates are not in the Q table because the coordinates are not needed, just the number of steps. And of course, this would be different for a different program, a different robot, a different reinforcement learning uh, system. So just to review, in one episode, there might be hundreds of actions, right? The, the agent might you know, hit a wall and just stay there and keep trying to go forward even though it can't. Um, the episode will likely be set to end when the reward is obtained. So you get re your reward and then that's the end of one episode and things are calculated and then there's a new episode and it runs again. Um, there is likely to be a limit to the number of actions or rather the number of moves or iterations because the agent might get stuck. So you don't want your program to run forever because your agent is stuck. The same agent, that is the program, will run for many episodes before it becomes adept at getting whatever the reward is, right? And the idea is get the reward with as few wasted actions as possible. And often in training, in real training for a real program, many copies of the agent would be running simultaneously on one computer or multiple computers to save time, to make the training go faster. And then uh, agents that were poor, uh, episodes that ended with a really low score, they would be thrown away, that copy of the program, and, and it's kind of like a survival of the fittest. Only the best copies would then be run again for the next episodes. So by using the Q table from a prior episode, this improves the chances that the next time the program, the agent will perform better, right? So the agent will usually choose an action based on the highest probability of success in that state. Um, so eventually as the numbers get higher for the good actions that lead to the reward, the robot will get better and better at always choosing that action, the desirable action, right? Uh, if all actions that are available have a value of zero in the table, then uh, the next action will be chosen at random, right? So if they're, if they're all equal, then there will be an option that will kick in in the programming and just say, okay, pick one of the actions available, just pick one at random. And then that would be tried and, and the agent will go on from there. So remember that this, this example with our robot and our ball, really, really simple, right? This is a simplistic example just for explanation, right? So in, in a real situation, in a real reinforcement learning uh, you know, test when people are developing something, they have to, part of the program, the programming has to factor in a balance between what's called exploration and exploitation. So exploitation is what we've talked about before. The more the robot learns, uh, the more it's going to do the same thing that brought it success before. And of course, this makes sense, right? If, if, uh, you know, if, if going forward in this situation helped you before, you're going to do that again. But often you want the system to ignore 
the best possibility in some of the cases to explore new options. And you can think about this, say, with a maze program. What about if you change the maze every so often? You don't want the program to get stuck in a rut or stuck in a loop where it's going to try to solve the new maze by using what worked in the old maze. So you want to build in some sort of independent thinking in a manner of speaking so that uh, sometimes the agent will try something that isn't the optimum move. And we're going to see some things about this next week when we talk about AlphaGo. Um, that program is amazing to watch because it, it could take a lot of options that it had never seen before. So I hope this discussion of Q learning has given you uh, an idea of how reinforcement learning works. Now, Q learning, reinforcement learning doesn't always use Q learning. Q learning is one way to do reinforcement learning. And Q learning doesn't have a neural network, but some methods of reinforcement learning, different methods, do use a neural network. And those might be uh, more, more successful or more practical in uh, environments that change a lot. So uh, say you're gonna build the Mars rover, you want something that can adapt to terrain that it's not familiar with. Whereas if you're uh, working with a game like chess, you know that the board is always gonna be eight by eight, so you don't have to worry about um, the environment itself changing, but of course the state will keep changing. So now let's look at some of the things today's robots are doing, thanks to AI. Not always thanks to AI, but often. A lot of news reports about robots emphasize some kind of fear factor. Often they send a message that automation is taking jobs away from humans. Even writers are not immune from this. Although when you hear about robots that write, there isn't a person-shaped robot sitting at a computer and typing, right? Like uh, people will call just the program itself a robot, but not all references to robots in the news mean an actual robot with you know, a mechanical body of some kind. So some references to robots really just mean software. Uh, software that can produce coherent written texts, for example which we will talk about in a future week. So let's make a few distinctions. Not all robots use AI. Some do, some don't. More and more, they do. More and more, there is at least some aspect of reinforcement training or some kind of neural network. If there's any kind of voice uh, interface, right, with speech recognition, and uh, question answering, which we'll also talk about in a future week. Um, those things have to have some kind of AI training to build that system. A lot of the robots that have some kind of physical presence do not have human shapes or even dog shapes like Boston Dynamics Spot, right? They might just be a robot arm in a factory, or they might be a little uh, sort of a case or a cooler on wheels. Um, so different kind of robots may not have arms or legs, uh, or they might have arms and not legs, or legs and not arms. A factory robot is often like this one you see here in the lower left, just an arm-like structure. And some factory robots um, really have not been trained with AI. They are specifically programmed because the factory floor is more predictable. Um, they're fixed in place and uh, they may be reprogrammed for say a different model of car, but there would be like kind of a, a menu of programs. And if they're building trucks today, they would use one program. And if they're building uh, compact cars another day, they would use a different program. Even robot vacuums are jumping on the AI bandwagon. This just cracked me up. So articles like this one focus on the automation of tasks, particularly tasks that only humans have performed up until now. So this is about software, computer programs 
that were trained to do tasks related to, eight, to language, um, to documents, to files, to doing work like office workers do with files, with accounts, uh, customers, um, you know, things like loans even, college applications. So certain tasks of this kind can be automated with software. But you want to read an article like this closely. If software can take over some of the work that I do that's repetitive and time consuming, that might actually be good for me. It doesn't mean I'm going to lose my job because in my job, I do a lot of other work that's not those repetitive, boring tasks, right? So if software can take over those tasks for me, I can spend more time doing more useful work that robots can't do. Also, in this article, there's nothing about physical robots. Now this article, on the other hand, talks about workers who perform physical tasks in industries such as manufacturing. It's a very real possibility that many of them will be losing jobs in the coming years to actual robots. And an interesting twist is that many of these jobs are in countries, other countries, not the United States, where the minimum wage is very, very low. People might be earning only two or three dollars a day. And yet companies are looking to replace those humans with robot workers. So these human replacement robots also include some machines we already know about, like self-checkout stations in supermarkets and retail stores, and even ATMs, automated teller machines. The article points out that before there were ATMs, which is probably before you were born, bank tellers used to have a very low-skilled job. But now, since ATMs handle most withdrawals and deposits that people make, and even you know automatic deposits from jobs, the bank teller jobs have become more skilled, and so those jobs now pay more than they used to back in the day. There's also an increasing interest in using robots in various kinds of healthcare situations including the use of human-shaped robots as aids for the elderly and for disabled people. These kinds of robots will always incorporate various kinds of AI, from machine vision to speech recognition, and also depending on what physical actions they might need to perform, right? Whether, say if they're feeding a person, right? They will have complicated systems that have been trained to you know, pick up forks and spoons and put food onto a utensil and hold it up to a real person's mouth, right? That is a complicated set of actions that would need to be trained into that system. Where robots and AI are concerned, we often have a combination of many systems that are working together in that machine, in that device. These various systems have been trained with machine learning. So some things that we should be thinking about at this point as we conclude this lecture. Automated systems can take over repetitive tasks. This can free people up to accomplish more work that machines can't do. So a lot of these automated systems will definitely include AI. Actual robots, which are devices in the physical world, they will be trained, and they are being trained, to see, listen, speak, and move using machine learning and also neural networks, right? As well as, in some cases, Q learning. Some uses of robots definitely will cause lost jobs for human beings. Some robots are controlled partly or completely by humans who are using a joystick or a controller. And you saw this in the second spot video, the longer video, the 20 minute video with Adam Savage, right? He is talking about which parts of spot are controlled with a joystick 
or a control panel, and which parts are trained with AI. So even robots that are mostly controlled by a human controller will have some parts of them that were trained with AI, like how they walk, how they move, how they stop and go, how they shut down, right? Some of those things may have been trained using AI techniques. We should also think about military applications of robots, right? Because the military is definitely building robots uh, and buying, buying robots, more buying robots and funding researchers who are developing other new robots, right? And some of these robots are autonomous vehicles like tanks and so forth. Many of them are some kind of drones, including drones that drop bombs and target buildings and fire missiles. And there are even automated exoskeletons that are sort of like, you know, Iron Man, but without as much coverage, where um, uh, a, uh, a, a military person, a soldier, straps on this automated exoskeleton and it helps them carry a heavier weight than they could carry on their own or walk farther or walk more accurately on difficult terrain. So you can definitely find these videos on YouTube if you do a little searching for like military robots. And finally, with all this talk about reinforcement learning, cue learning, training machines through experience, right? Whether they're just automated software or whether they are physical robots with arms and legs and so forth. All the concerns that we talked about two weeks ago about the ethics of should this technology be let loose in the world and who has oversight over this technology, who is checking to see whether this technology is dangerous to us, whether the dangers outweigh the good right? Transparency so we can understand how does the robot make the decision that it makes. We have to ask all the same questions about all robotics systems and automated systems. So I hope this lecture has given you some new things to think about, not only in this different kind of machine learning, reinforcement learning, that is often used to train robotic systems, but also just with robots in general and how they take over or assist with certain human tasks and whether we should be concerned about certain things or whether we should just be happy and welcome the robots that make our lives easier.